Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do you intend to pray, but can never quite seem to find the time? Do your prayers often go unanswered? Does your patience run thin in the silence and then your fear set in? Or maybe do you just wonder how to pray if you are doing it right? Do your prayers feel like a struggle, like you're wrestling against yourself or rather against God? Prayer is hard. It requires discipline persistence, and patience. The struggle grappling with God in prayer is not because of some kind of intrinsic failure with God. Your fight is not with God. Because God has promised to hear your prayers. He has promised to answer them. He has promised to provide for you. Your fight is not with God. But the conflict is actually internal to you, between what St. Paul calls the old Adam and the new man in Christ. Again, Paul calls your flesh the old man, the old Adam. And he tells us about this old man. You can read Romans if you like. The old man trusts in himself, in his own resources and his own ability. But despite trusting in himself, the old man often fails to be responsible, to care for himself, and to care for those around him. The old man, trusting in himself, then inherently distrusts God. Because he doesn't trust God, now he fears even to speak to God. The old man would cower in presence of an almighty and holy God. That old man lives in a natural state of fear, and in fear, unfaithfulness to God. Because of all this, the old man has no hope in himself, and he has no future as he lives apart from God. On the other hand, the new man, which was born anew by holy baptism, that's the gift of Christ's spirit, well, that new man is Christ Jesus. And Christ loves to speak with God the Father, as dear children do with their dear Father. This new man, Christ, loves to dwell in the presence of his gracious and merciful Father. The new man is faithful, inherently trusting in God the Father for all that is needed for body and for life. The new man lives in a natural state of faith toward the Father and in love toward his fellow mankind. The new man leans not on himself and his own understanding, but it commits his way to God the Father in everything by prayer. Ask and it will be given to you. Ask and you will receive and your joy may be full. Now when the old man hears those words, he hears a magic formula. <laughs> Just ask and you'll get it. He latches on to the whatever and misses the last part. Ask in my name, in my name. Can we push around God and get him from him whatever we want, whether it is good or ill for us? No, the content of whatever is determined by in my name. You remember the second commandment shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we not misuse his name to curse or to swear or to practice magic or to lie or to deceive. But in every time of need, we call upon him with prayer and praise and with thanks. 
That's what in the name means. And that tells us whatever we might ask for. Or if you prefer, you could listen to Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount when he says this, to guide our prayers. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Our prayers are not guided by whatever the old man wants, but rather what God has commanded and promised. That's his kingdom and his righteousness. But that means then our prayers can be misinformed or malformed. The Apostle James writes, you desire and do not have, and so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. James 4. This James, the brother of Jesus and Bishop of Jerusalem, tells you, the church, that your prayers can be malformed. You ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, he said. You can use prayer for ill intent, to ask out of covetousness, or out of your passions and desires, or just out of worldliness. These are the prayers of the child, prayers driven by worldly anxiety and love of stuff. And these are really no different than any of the other prayers of, the, of this world, the hopes and prayers of the pagans. Thoughts and prayers, people say. That's all again because the old man is driven by the passions of the flesh. He misunderstands God and so he misuses prayer. He considers God the Father kind of like a divine vending machine. And then when God happens to give you what you ask for, whether it be a pony or a car or the home or that wealth, how does that often go? Its luster and its joy always fades away. But Jesus' way of praying is different. He gives you prayers that have answers and answers that never end. Because Jesus promises to you to the Holy Spirit and the Spirit will guide your prayers by the means that he has chosen. The new man knows that you don't even need to ask for clothing, shoes, food, house, and the like. God has already provided those things even without you asking. You're free to ask for them if only just to remember that he provides them. God provides all these things even for the Gentiles, he says, without their prayers. So what is it that you should pray for? The new man knows what is truly needed. And for that, we should look at the context of today's gospel reading. This is in the upper room on the night our Lord is betrayed. These disciples whom Jesus is instructing are in a time of great spiritual distress. They have clothing, shoes, house and home. They're being provided for, there's food on the table. That's not their problem. How will they have the strength to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from the faith, to fall away from Christ? And indeed, we know how the story goes. Of their own ability, their own strength, They cannot withstand Peter even denying our Lord three times. But he also makes a great promise to them on that night, a promise that he realizes fully on the day of Pentecost. Again, his promised answer is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's gifts. These are the only source of true and lasting joy for the Christian. And these are the means by which the God guides your prayers. So back to the point, whatever things should we ask then in Jesus' name? We know our prayers should be guided by what Jesus has promised to us, but what would that look like? Well, you've actually already been doing it. (laughs) You have been praying in Jesus' name today, for better or for worse, his pastor is on the wrong service. Um, You've been praying in Jesus' name as you ask for what he has promised in the words of 
the liturgy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, we'll say. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so forth. The liturgy, whichever setting we're in, prays for what Jesus has promised. Start to finish. Lord, have mercy. Glory be to God on high. Peace on earth among those in whom he is well pleased. And by these words appointed in the church, in our liturgy, the words, Jesus' very words, he gives us and renews in us his spirit. I'm reticent to try to apply this uh, to this secular feast day of Mother's Day, but actually the ancients did describe the church as your mother. A mother who nurtures you in the faith, who guides you in the way you should go, and a mother who gives you gifts. One of the ways we honor our parents, our spiritual parents, maybe earthly parents too, is by preserving those gifts that they give to us in the church. That's what's in your pew, a hymnal, which is mostly old and some new, the preserved songs and prayers and liturgies that our mother, the church, has handed forward to us. We don't preserve them just because they came from our mothers, our spiritual mothers in the faith. We preserve them because they deliver to us what Jesus has promised to give, his holy word. And by them, the Spirit delivers Jesus' forgiveness, Jesus' life, and Jesus' salvation, over and over. The Holy Spirit delivering forgiveness of sins by Christ's shed blood. The Holy Spirit joining you to Christ's death and resurrection, working through water and the Word, granting you eternal salvation. The Spirit delivering to you from the altar of God, Jesus' own body and blood under bread and wine for your life and salvation. All these gifts of the Spirit are given to you so that you would have peace and joy that carries over into your day and week. The gifts of the Spirit and the liturgy give peace and joy that surpasses all understanding. See, part of the problem is, is that you think of prayer very narrowly, simply just asking of God what you want. But prayer is far more than that. Prayer is asking of God what he has promised to give. And that's what we do here each and every Sunday. The liturgy teaching you to pray in Jesus' name and to ask precisely for what Jesus has promised. The liturgy joining you to Christ and hiding you in the shelter of his wings. And then as you can stand now before the Father, as you've been clothed in Jesus, so also Jesus intercedes for you, praying for you to the Father. And the Father hears your prayers because he sees Jesus as he sees you, that new man that you received in your baptism. That means that you can pray without ceasing. You can stand before your holy and righteous God because you have Jesus' name placed upon your forehead and your heart, a name that casts out fear because perfect love always casts out fear. Yes, it's true, prayer is hard. It requires discipline, persistence, and patience. The struggle grappling with God in prayer is not because of some failure of God. It's only hard because it's hard for us to listen, to receive, and to be blessed by God through his word and gifts. We lack that discipline, persistence, and patience to receive from Jesus his word and to keep our trust there. Again, the fight is not with God. He has promised to hear us, to receive us and, and to give to us as he has promised. And so Jesus teaches you to pray. But even if you don't know the words to pray, so again, the mother, your mother, the church, has put the words of Jesus into your hearts and minds and upon your lips to speak today. He gives you the words to speak. And he also gives you brothers and sisters of that mother to pray with. 
That is why when we confess, we confess out loud. While we pray, we pray out loud. Not only for the sake of our own speaking, but for the sake of our neighbor's hearing, that they too would be encouraged and strengthened by that word of Jesus. And it is Jesus who establishes the rhythm and prayer of the Christian life lived in prayer. So it is always, each and every day, death and resurrection with Jesus. Death of that old Adam that knows not how to pray, and new life in Christ, the new man who prays without ceasing. And all this is yours because you know, without a shadow of doubt, that Jesus died for you, and that God the Father thus loves you. And because he loves you, you know that he hears you, and that he will always answer you. May God grant it in the name of Jesus. Amen.